Welcome to the EKG Guy, if this is your first time. I'm glad you're joining us, and welcome back if you're returning. So we've been going through our EKG coding reference guide, and if this is your first time, if you need access, all you have to do is go to this link here, enter your email, click Submit, and then you'll get an email, and in that email there will be a link to get access. Okay, and then you'll be to our coding reference guide, and we are now looking at hypertrophy. In this lecture, we're going to look at left ventricular hypertrophy or thickening of that left ventricular wall. And this is part four. We've gone through part one, where we looked at general features, P wave abnormalities, atrial enlargement. We looked at different types of rhythms, sinus, atrial, junctional, and ventricular. We looked at different types of conduction blocks, first, second, Mobitz one and two, and third degree. And we went through some voltage criteria, and now we looked at some axis and now into hypertrophy. In this lecture, we're going to look at left ventricular hypertrophy. Okay, if you want access to our other course material, our books, you can go to www.ekg.md. Okay, and there you can find a number of different resources, our books. You can click on this here, and there you'll see uh, a lot of the things that we have. We have hundreds of videos that are not part of the 300 or 400 you see on YouTube. So separate ones that we use when we teach our students that you can get there. Okay, so let's get started. So left ventricular hypertrophy, what does this mean? This means hypertrophy or thickening of the left ventricular wall. So remember the left ventricle, if we draw our heart here, this is the right atrium, the left atrium, right ventricle, and left ventricle, that's this one here, we're saying there's thickening of this wall, okay? Thickening of the wall, and we're not specifying to which region, but uh, the cause of this maybe for many reasons, okay? Oftentimes with age, people will get this, uh, whether it's from hypertension, so uncontrolled blood pressures that are too elevated, maybe from aortic stenosis. Remember the aortic, aortic comes off the left ventricle, so you may have stenotic uh, valve of the aorta that may then result in back pressure, okay? So there's a number of different reasons. We won't get them into them all here, but um, the main thing is thickening of that left ventricular wall. And as we get through some of these criteria, you'll learn and you'll look at different re references that there are so many proposed criteria. The problem with it is that they have uh, quite a high specificity. So when the criteria are present, we tend to be able to rule it in. However, they have a low sensitivity. And generally, the specificity is almost in the 90%, uh, whereas the sensitivity is down in 30%. So we're missing many cases, okay? So meaning that the absence of that finding does not, uh, in fact, rule it out. And what we've been doing is, uh, more recently, is using artificial intelligence to help us uh, interpret and actually better define some of these things. So that's come of some of the uh, recent research we've been doing. So let's look at the criteria that we have proposed. And there's a few things I need you to, first of all, uh, understand. Most of them involve R waves or an S wave. Okay, so it's important that you understand what an R wave is and what an S wave is. Remember that the R wave is the first positive deflection of the QRS complex. So if you have a complex here, here's a negative deflection, positive deflection, negative deflection, okay, of this. This is, would be a Q wave, this would be an R wave, this is an S wave. So the R wave is the first positive deflection. If you have a complex that looks like this, this is an R wave, this is an S wave, okay? So that's important. An S wave is the first negative deflection after an R wave, okay? Notice this was a Q wave and this one is an S wave, okay? Here's the S wave too in this uh, complex. So it's important to be able to identify these and make sure that you're not looking at the depth of an S or a Q wave when we're looking at these S waves, okay? So let's look at some of these criteria, okay? So there's the Cornell criteria, the Sokolow Lion criteria, and then there's a standalone criteria. There's many others, but these are a few that are uh, some that you should keep to mind, okay? Now the Cornell criteria says when we should look at the R wave in AVL and the S wave in V3, and it has a gender specific, okay? In men, if it's at least 28 millimeters in amplitude, that meets the criteria, okay? If it's over 20 millimeters in women, that meets the criteria, okay? So what we do is we look at lead AVL, and then we also look at the S wave in V3, 
okay? And what you're doing here is you're looking at the amplitude. So it's hard that these complexes almost overlap, but it looks like the top of this one is here to there, okay? And if you would count these up, it's about five boxes for this here, okay? And the other one is going up. So it's probably about 12 millimeters there, okay, total. And then if you look at the S wave in V3, there's not really not much here, okay? Remember, that's the S wave we're looking at, okay? So maybe five millimeters, we can say five. And then so 12 plus five is 17, okay? So it doesn't really meet the criteria in a man or a woman, okay? So these uh, male, female, gender specific criteria have been proposed by Cornell and colleagues and this is uh, doesn't meet it here and this patient was a 75 year old male uh, with hypertension okay so the Cornell criteria is not met uh, based on this now there's some other criteria and one that looks at the lead v1 okay the s wave in that lead and the r wave in v5 or v6 and I say V5 or V6 because they suggest taking the one with the greater amplitude. So if you look at V6, here's an R wave, okay? And then V5, it looks like it goes all the way up to here, okay? So if you were to choose which one has the greater amplitude, it's V5 here, okay? So we wouldn't use V6. So what we would do is take the S wave amplitude in V1, and we would add it to the R wave amplitude in V5. So let's find the S wave amplitude in V1. So here's V1. We're measuring all the way down here. Remember that each one of these thick lines here is five millimeters. Each small box is one millimeter. So that's five, 10, 15, and a few millimeters on each side is about 20. Okay, so about 20 millimeters of the S wave. So 20 millimeters or 20 small boxes. And then you would add it to the R wave amplitude. And in this case, we can see there's one full one here, two, three, four, okay, and about five, a few millimeters here, and about four there. So we would say that's one, two, three, four, five, so 25. So 25, 20 millimeters plus 25 millimeters, 45 millimeters, okay? And look that that exceeds it. We have a male that's over the age of 40, so we'd want to use this. Okay, or excuse me, this one, the 35 millimeters, and that's certainly what we meet, okay? So hopefully that makes sense. Again, you're using the R wave with the greatest amplitude, which was V5 here, okay? And then we're using V1's uh, S wave amplitude. So in this case, we did meet this uh, Sokolo criteria. So it, again, it was the S wave and V1 we saw, plus the R wave and V5, or V6 you can use, okay? And then in those that it should be greater than 35 millimeters, if patients are greater than 40 years old, okay? And it should be greater than 40 millimeters in patients between the ages of 30 and 40 years of age, okay? So hopefully that makes sense. Now there's also a standalone criteria that looks at the R wave and AVL. So again, here's AVL. And what it's saying is the amplitude should be greater than 12 millimeters, okay? So again, we said that was about 12 millimeters, so maybe just barely meeting that criteria, okay? So again, um, these are just some of the criteria proposed. There's many other ones. I want you to keep in mind that uh, you really need to know that this has a high specificity and low sensitivity, these uh, criteria that we're showing here. Now, the minimal voltage criteria, how we define that is if one of these is present, we call that minimal voltage criteria. If there's more than two or at least two, then we call that moderate voltage criteria, okay? Again, voltage, because we're looking at the amplitude, which is the voltage. Remember, voltage is on our, our y-axis or going up and down vertically, and their x-axis is time, so time and voltage on the EKG. So hopefully that makes sense. So again, we're really looking at the amplitude or voltage when using this criteria or any of these. And just to review, there's the Cornell that's looking at the AVL R wave and the S wave in V3. And men should be 20 more than 28 and then women more than 20. The Sokolo Lion, we looked at the S wave 
and the R waves in those precordial leads, okay? And we saw that if it's greater than 35 in uh, patients more than 40 years of age, that would meet the criteria, and greater than 40 millimeters in those between 30 and 40. And then the Sokolo line, the standalone, looking at AVL, again, that R wave should be more than 12 millimeters, okay? So hopefully that makes sense. Again, there's many criteria you'll see out there. I would stick with just a few, and these ones are the ones I would stick with for now. They're, again, high specificity, about 90% in most of these, but low sensitivity. And it, it just shows that there's a lot of patients that are getting missed, and we're trying to develop new technology to identify those patients, uh, those that actually may have left ventricular systolic dysfunction that may benefit from therapy because we know if we treat them earlier, they have better outcomes, they have later onset of uh, heart failure symptoms and better uh, morbidity and mortality, a decreased uh, both of those. So hopefully that makes sense, okay? So left ventricular hypertrophy, thickening of that left ventricular wall here. Okay, so that's some of the EKG criteria and that's the end of this lecture. I hope you learned something. Now, just to keep you in mind uh, of our course material that we have available, so again, if you go to our website, www.ekg.md, okay, so this is our website, and what you'll notice is that if you go to the EKG course here, okay, you'll find stuff that's separate. So notice that we have a number of topics, practice material, lectures, a way for you to contribute, and this is the course here over here so you'll notice we have over 300 videos or so and that's more on youtube there's another 100 more than 100 about 200 videos that are available with the course so those are separate videos and this course is really designed to take you from a beginner to advanced interpreter okay so completely separate from what you're getting online for free okay these are um, course material that comes with it so notice that you have a book Okay, and then you also have the pocket guide available. So you can choose which format. They are the same thing, both these uh, book and the pocket guide, uh, different formats. Uh, I really like this small one because you can keep it in your white coat if you're in the clinic or in your pocket and it's really available on the go. Now with the book, you also get videos. So notice these are the videos, okay? And these are a video for every single page in that book. So it's over 30 hours of video. Now there's a number of practice material that I continue to upload there. Okay, we'll have practice questions coming soon. Uh, so all of that's available. Again, this is separate from all the free material that you get already. Okay, so this is more high yield stuff. This is what we used to teach our uh, technicians here and our students here at Mayo Clinic and it's used now among many institutions so use uh, check that out now what it also includes are calipers so yes you get calipers with this course okay um, i don't know anyone else that offers that but you do get calipers i think they're very helpful and they can uh you know if you know how to use them correctly uh can help to identify different uh, arrhythmias that are going on okay and then you also get our pocket EKG reference. Okay, this was something we've put together as we were developing course for the fellows. Uh, and this is really nice. It has every code, as you saw earlier, laid out there, very small pocket guide available. I had help with uh, my colleague, Dr. Peter Noseworthy, who's the head of the EKG lab here at Mayo Clinic in editing it. So this is something that we use um, and we found very helpful. So Go to the EKG course, you'll see examples of lectures, okay, why we developed this, okay. A lot of it came about from myself struggling with learning EKGs, having a father that was an interventional cardiologist and, you know, still struggling. So uh, my struggle is a struggle that I don't want you to have in learning them, okay. You can read all those introductory books, but honestly, they are not uh, enough, okay, and you find yourself using other resources which is part of the learning process. I wanted to expedite that process for you and make it less uh, inefficient uh, in pretty much what I struggled with going and learning through EKG. So again, from beginner to advanced level with this course, uh, you get the book, the calipers, the coding reference, video access, okay? And now we're offering 25% off. 
25% off. Put that code in on checkout and uh, you'll have yourself um, 25% off that will even, it's pretty much covers the cost of what we use to print the material. So uh, we don't really make much off it. It's more to help our learners grow and really be able to contribute to patient care. That's why we do this and we love doing it. So thank you so much for your support. Um, if you have any questions, just leave them below and we're happy to answer them. All right. Have a great day.